Okay. Okay. It looks like we are recording. Wonderful. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Jory, for joining me today. I'm really excited to be interviewing you. And um, I read your book, like I said before to you, and I loved it. And I just want to give a quick intro to my readers as to who you are and what your book is about. So Dr. Brian Jory is a professor at Berry College near Atlanta, Georgia, where he serves as chair of the education department and is also the director of the family studies program. He earned his doctor of philosophy from Florida State University in family science. He also has a master's degree from Michigan State University in family and child science. And he also attended college at Santa Clara University in California, where he majored in psychology of religion. So you have a lot of credentials under your belt. <laughs> Very impressive. All of which means I went to college until I was 29 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. And every year um, my, my uncles were like, Still going to college? Yeah. <laughs> it should be a lifelong experience for everybody. Yeah. And then in 2018, you wrote and published this book mm -hmm. called Cupid on Trial, What We Learn About Love When We When Loving Gets Tough. And um, I read that book. And like I said before, I loved it. So let's just dive right in. Unless you have anything you want to add to your credentials, feel free. I do want to tell my story just for a minute. Absolutely. You know, I was 10 years old and I uh, looked around my family and I love my parents dearly, but I did think, wow, I think I could do better than this. And <laughs> I started talking with my neighbor who had just moved in out in our yard and she was a psychologist. And I asked her what that meant. She explained it all to me, you know. Um, you get paid to help people. And I said, oh, you can get paid to help people. I made up my mind at 10 years old. That's what I wanted to do with my life. And I really never deviated from that. So um, went to college till I was 29 and then um, did all kinds of things with the rest of my life. So I'm deeply dedicated. That's what I want your listeners to get. I'm dedicated to making the world better by helping people make their relationships. Uh, that's a beautiful philosophy, and I see that philosophy is one of your degrees. It's yep. another another uh, interest of mine. I've been uh, reading philosophy since I was 16. So I can see the interconnectedness there of all your, your degrees and certifications and what you've done your whole life. So uh, I commend you on all of that, and I know that I'm sure you've done some great work in helping people with difficult relationships and loving themselves, too. Yes, and I teach at a college where I teach courses on intimacy, sexuality, um, and we spend a lot of time talking about love. With So when people say, what do you do for your day job, Brian? I teach 20-year-olds about love, intimacy, and sexuality, and I always get a very big grin like, you get paid to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I get paid nicely to do that. And they love the classes, and I love teaching them. I always tell my students, you could blindfold me, gag me, tie my hands behind my back. I'll still love teaching this class and do a good job with it. So wonderful. It's a passion. That's great to hear. Because there's there's a lot of professors that just get up there and teach oh. and they really don't I mean, you know, so <laughs> but it, it's unfortunate, but so it's it's really nice to see someone with your energy and passion. Let's well, talk I a love, little bit about your book too. Okay. Uh you know, I love uh, um teaching my students because I learn from them. I mean, there's so much I have learned about the way the world is for them. And I made the mistake of telling my students, I don't think you're really gonna like this book. And then one of them came into my office a few months ago, right after it was published and she read it. She said, Dr. Jory, why do you say we won't love this book? I said, I just think you have to have a certain amount of experience in life. She's like, I love this book. We all love it. That's uh, because we don't have that experience. So we're learning something from it. So uh, I, that was a great day to hear that. And it turns out to be true that they do love the book and they get, seem to get a lot out of it. Both boys and girls, you know, a lot of times um, 
we think, well, only women read books about relationships and love. And, you know, it's a very soft, cozy, uh, comfy little book. Like but romance guys, novels. Well, right now, guys are loving this book. And I'm, I'm heading off to London uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, for the London Book Fair. And I've got two interviews lined up there with guys who are trying to write reviews of this book in London mm. for males. They're like, I think guys would really get a lot out of this uh, book, especially following on everything that happened in 2018 and continues, you know, with the Me Too movement. Yes. One of them asked me about the Me Too movement, like, what is it? I said, well, I think women have put us on notice. Their bodies are not for public consumption. Mm. <laughs> That's very well said. Yeah. And uh, when I said it, I said, hey, that's a good way to put it. Uh, and boy, did that lead into an interesting discussion with this guy who's a journalist who's writing about this book for men. So ask me some more questions. I'm happy to talk. Awesome. Um, so you've spent your, your entire career, you know, researching relationships and teaching about intimacy and couples counseling. Can you tell us a little bit more about you know, your experience doing that? And was that the driving force for your book? It, well, my experience is the driving force because I um, got my doctorate at Florida State University and went and practiced um, in a setting that was in a hospital. So uh, I had a practice, but I went into the hospital five days a week and I worked with the psychiatrists and the nurses um, consulted in the emergency room. And when people read this book, they'll notice there's a lot of doctors in this book. There's a lot of people in hospitals in the book and, there, and references to medical conditions and things like that. That comes straight out of that experience. And I've always kept up with that. I have several doctors who are friends and I, the subjects I teach, I do, I spend a lot of time doing medical research in preparation for them. I'm not a medical researcher, but I know a lot about conditions, how they, for example, there's a, a young woman in the book. She has a very rare condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which basically for her, for us, comes down to when she was born. Nobody knew whether she was a boy or a girl. There's another term for it called intersex. Yes. And some of them don't like that condition. I noted the book the story I wrote in the book about this particular woman, she did not like the concept of being an intersex person. She identified herself as a female. And she could do that because, I don't know how far I can say this, but she was very proud to tell me, not in a, not in a dirty, quirky way, but really in a way that, that she does have a very beautiful vagina. Yes. Which, honestly, many of them don't because of the surgical procedures they've had. She was fortunate. Her parents uh, rejected the medical procedures to, quote, cosmetol, you know, it's, it's, it's plastic surgery to make right. her vagina more feminine. Um, that usually does not help. And um, anyways, for this young woman, it's like going through life with the idea that you know, I would have to tell somebody that I became intimate with that when I was born, they didn't know the, whether I was a boy or a girl. That's a hard way to start the dating life when you're yes. 15 years old. Yes. So, yes. Um, so I have a background in, in medical work. I also spent uh, about three years doing um, criminal psychology. I was a social worker in a police department. and. Um, Boy, did I learn a lot there about uh, what happens at accidents and what happens at, in domestic violence. And um, I learned a lot about how people lie to one another and, and the issues that come out that are, are practically bordering on criminal and sometimes are criminal. So you do see a lot of that. I did a lot of consulting work uh, for, in Georgia, we call it DFACS, the Department of Family and Children's Services. So. I spent a lot of time doing evaluations for defects, and I learned a lot there about 
um, the way the court system works, I was an expert witness in oh, maybe like 40 or 50 different cases. So I know how courtrooms work, how lawyers work. So you see that a lot coming through in my book too. Oh. Yeah, because part of the story is a car accident that took place yeah. where a pregnant woman's child died. And that was extremely interesting too, to see the whole dynamic between the relationship she was in and the whole lying thing too tied in in there well you know that came out of all of the stories in this book are true stories i've had yes. people say to me wow would that really happen i'm like i know for a fact it happened i was there and in this particular story where there's this car accident there are actually two car accidents in the book but in the one that came out of a, uh, an experience I had in the emergency room in working in the hospital where a man actually had this experience. I'm not going to spoil the ending of the book for anybody or anything like that. So just needless to say, he had to make some decisions about what love really meant for him. He was in a tragic crisis. And when you get into the crises, that's what you learn in the emergency room, you know, when it's life and death and life is touch and go, you really think a lot about who you love. Sure. You, don't think, you never think in those situations about money or jobs right. or houses or cars. Right. Things we tend to spend a lot of time thinking about under normal circumstances, that all blurs into the background. You begin to think about who you love and who loves you. And that's why I say love is forever because I know working with this man in the emergency room he got that for the first time in good memories we hope mm -hmm. you know and some people only have bad memories but you have to realize that every day when you get out of bed it's like what memories am i creating for the people around me today what memories am i creating for myself that's an underlying theme of the book my book is about personal responsibility in relationships and other topics that are related, forgiveness, uh, trust, honesty, um, things that we all, nobody's gonna argue that those are good things, but yet we don't spend enough time thinking about them. Right. On a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what I wanted to get people to do as they read this book, is begin to think about themselves. You know, when you listen to people talk about their relationships, we're all, I hope I'm not like this, but many of us are apt to talk more about how we're loved. Our partner did this, did that, didn't remember my birthday, didn't do this, didn't do that. But we spend so little time thinking about ourselves, what we do, what we don't do. Right. Here's a perfect example. I recently was counseling a woman and she came because her husband had an affair. She actually said, <laughs> she hadn't had sex with him in 10 years. I looked at her and I said, you say you haven't had sex with him in 10 years. Did it surprise you that he would have an affair? Right. Yes. She said, yes. I'm like, why would that surprise you? You know, well, she just didn't really think about what she was giving to him. Now, right. in her mind, of course, she had her reasons and this and that. But I mean, I think anytime you have to think every day, how am I treating the person I love? What are they struggling with? And how do I adapt to their issues? We spend way too much time thinking whether they're going to adapt to us. Are they going to get right. mad at us? Well, a lot but, of people, they don't want to take onus of them. And they often forget that, you know, it's, it's literally 50-50. So it it's is. really important to remember that. Right. And, you know, I can't tell you, uh, you know, I do a couple counseling along with teaching and the other research I do. And I cannot tell you the number of women who have made this state. Um, he used to buy me flowers. Mm. Now he says flowers are a waste of money. Oh, I hear that a lot, too. Oh, yes. And um, I always tell the guys, they're like, well, they are a waste of money. I'm like, well, you didn't think that when you were trying to lure her into your world. Mm. You didn't think that when you were like overwhelmed with lust and passion and all that for her. So why is it that somewhere along the line, when did flowers become a waste of money? 
it's what does she hear? She hears, I'm a waste. Right. What, you know, and of course, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out, Caroline. But you just have to think about yourself. Like, how am I affecting the people around me? The person I love the most is the person I should think about a lot. And yet we don't. Right. Now you talked about, you know, men giving women flowers and you, you, you mentioned, um, not in your book, but somewhere in your writing, I read that you feel that the past generations, the way relationships were developed and nurtured were very different than they are today. Could you just, because I want, I want some of my readers to like understand um, you know, what relationships were like in the past for people, say, under 30. And, I, you know, I, too, believe that they were very different. So could you go over some of the key points and why okay. maybe this transition happened? I would. I can, I can give a short answer and a long answer. Let me decide. Okay, I would say the short answer is that we have extended young adulthood and adolescence well into the 20s. Mm -hmm. In previous generations, people were considered an adult when they were 18 years old. You right. turned 18, you're an adult now. Um, now, for example, at my college, we know that 40% of the students will graduate from college at 21, 22 and go back home and live with their parents. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to go to grad school or they're going to work at you know, building a resume, they're going to work for in some low, uh, you know, they're not going to be self-supporting, self-reliant individuals. So just do the math a little bit. You know, most women go into puberty between 12 and 14, mm -hmm. some younger than that. And the average, the median age of marriage now is 26 for women. Now, in 1980, the median age of marriage was 20.4. That means that at age 20, half the women in America were already married. That was only less than 40 years ago. Half the women were married at 20. Now, half are married by 26. And if they go to college, it's closer to 28. For men, it's, it's around 29 for first marriage. So do your math. I mean, if you reach puberty and those hormones are flowing and, um, you know, your bodies, our bodies are developed for passion and for love. Our minds are, are designed to connect and to attach to people. And all that starts, you know, uh, uh, what we call early adult uh, adolescence now. Well, that's a lot of years to fill. So that's really a big difference is that people aren't going to marry for a long, long time. So the relationships that they have are going to be temporary relationships. Now, a lot, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, a girl who's 18, she might be looking for dating for a permanent relationship, mm -hmm. somebody she's going to marry. I'll tell you a really interesting story about my own daughter, who a few years ago, she turned 15 and she wanted to have a boyfriend. She actually asked, can I have a boyfriend? And I told her, you can have a boyfriend, we are going to meet him, but you can have a boyfriend if you have a plan to break up with him. <laughs> wow. And she's like, why? I said, because you're 15 years old. This is not a boy you're going to marry. Right. You're too young. So that means you're going to break up with him at some point. And I really don't want to see you locked in a relationship or trapped in a relationship, a bad relationship that you don't know how to get out of. Like some of your friends. She had some friends that were in very abusive, bad relationships, and the girl didn't really know how to end it. So I said, you make a plan first. So she did. She had the boyfriend. And I would say six weeks later, it was not a long-term relationship for sure. She came home late from school one afternoon. And I said, where were you? And she said, I stopped off at my boyfriend's. We executed the plan. <laughs> so, oh, she, so she, uh, yeah, she was actually pretty proud of that, that she wasn't going to end up like her, one of her best friends who was like, had this horrible relationship. Okay. 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 So, okay right, so I, have, 
I was saying that that's a beautiful life lesson for your daughter to be able to gain that experience at a young age to know that, okay, this relationship is not going to be forever. It's just a part of my development. Yes. And I, I think that this is what parents can do for their children is, you know, help them understand that most of their relationships in their teens and their early 20s are experimental relationships. They're ones that you're going to learn a lot if you're smart. We should all be learning from those relationships. And don't lock on to somebody really too fast because you're, you are young. And, yes, uh, yes. and uh, I, I think both boys and girls need to understand that, that, you know, this is a part of you growing up. It's not, not that you're looking for somebody to fall in love with and, you're going to be with this person the rest of your life and have babies and the picket fence and all that. And that's, I would say that's the second thing I would say about how relationships have changed is that, you know, we live in a world now where we believe in personal freedom, where who you love is your choice. Now, certainly that did not exist. We have now same sex relationships. Mm -hmm. Some people don't agree with that, but I personally think love is love and yes. we have to respect the choices that people make. Um, also, we accept things like cohabitation, whereas, you know, a generation and a half ago, that was called living in sin. Right. Uh, uh, you know, shacking up or playing yeah. house. Very derogatory. Now, it's a stage of, we know that easily... 60 plus percent of couples when they do marry have lived together and uh that's not always a good thing uh it's not a good thing i would here's my take on living together uh and it's based on research that i've you know put a lot of effort into studying and knowing and that is when you move in with somebody and you're you know a couple together living together you've probably made a choice to eventually marry that person mm -hmm. because it's very hard to get out of those relationships. So we know that uh, I try to caution people. No, if you're in love and you're engaged and you know this is the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, that's one thing. Okay. But if this is a person that you're moving in to test the waters and see how it goes, you could be stuck in that relationship. And I have a term for it called sliding into marriage. Too many. It's why if you do live with somebody, there's a slight, slight, slight chance that you're not going to work out with them for marriage. Your marriage is slightly more likely to, you're slightly more likely to end up in divorce. You're slightly more likely to be unhappy. It's not a huge difference, but it's a small difference. And I tell them it's because some people end up married who wouldn't have gotten married mm -hmm. had they not moved in together in the first place. True. So I, so I think that moving in with somebody is a pretty big step that people ought to think about a lot more about before they do it. Um, the other things that are different, well, you know, we now have equality between the sexes, or at least we're striving for it. it it's not true in all situations and in all phases of life. Mm -hmm. But I think, as we said before, Women have made it clear they want to run their own lives and their own bodies and their own minds, and they have no need for men to tell them how to think, how to live their lives, uh, when to have sex. They can initiate sex if they want to themselves. Um, and women expect more from men in relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, they expect the man to be able to listen to their emotions and understand and not blow them off or say, hey, I got a game, I got to go. Um, so we're looking for more at this equality between the sexes is really the big player, I think, is like, I believe that uh, women are exploring this independence and it's good for them that they can make decisions because if you really look back through history, you see women had so limited uh, possibilities for their lives. I teach at Berry College. It's named after Martha Berry. Martha Berry uh, was a really fantastic woman who was friends of presidents and friends of princes and princesses in Europe. And she was engaged at one time. And she realized that if she married this man, 
he would have control of this college that she started. And so she backed out of the marriage because marriage was not an option for her to maintain control of the college. Now, that's kind of a metaphorical story for women give up a lot in relationships. Yes. It's all the time. They give up their freedoms because the man expects them to follow him. If he moves, she's going to go where he's going. She expects, he expects her to accommodate his wishes for what to eat, where to go out, the lifestyle. So women, and women have done that for her. Well, I think we, I think that, I mean, I can only speak for the United States really, but I think we have a very deep respect for like tradition. Yes. And, you know, you, you want to keep the traditions of your family and, you know, as a child growing up, you watching what your mother's doing. And in many ways you want to like mirror that out of your love and respect for her. So like what's going on right now, I think hasn't had time to really seed itself in tradition. I could not agree with you more, uh, Carolyn. What I see is these things are experimentally new. We're still learning how to understand yes. uh, what relationships are like. But for my take, men have a lot to learn. And mm-hmm. it's the m- fathers who have the control to teach their children how to be respectful, how to not put make every situation a competition, how to learn to listen to other people, to use empathy and get inside their heads. Now, I'll be the first to say, based on science, we haven't really gotten to that place in the way our bodies and our brains are formed. It's absolutely true. Boys and girls, men and women, from the time they're in the womb, our brains are slightly different, our bodies form differently, our hormones are different. And yet, I think we've amplified those differences way too much. Um, we, we've got to begin to realize it's okay for men to have feelings. I, I am, have a lot of compassion right now for men in our society. Oh, so do I. So that do could I. get me in a lot of trouble to say that because there are people who have no compassion. But honestly, I think uh, men are now, they got their wake up call. And um, you don't just, over and grab a woman's butt because that's what you want to do. You don't make inappropriate comments to her that are sexual Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, you want to find out is she going to like maybe respond in a way you'd like. You know, you've got to be respectful in the way you treat women. And I think that it's the men that are going to teach that. Yeah, women can send out the beacon and the call and say, we're not going to put up with this bullshit anymore. True, but you know, there's such a fine line because um, like I worked in corporate America most of my life and I put up with a lot of garbage and I never told anybody, I never, you know, reported anyone for anything. I just uh, dealt with it in my way and tried to be a strong woman and accepted it. But Where's the fine line between being okay with flirting? Because flirting is beautiful. Flirting yes. is is the beginning of this connection that we also deeply want. But like, I think a lot of young folks are having this this problem. Where is it okay? Especially men, and that's where I kind of feel a little bad for them because a lot of good men got caught up in the Me Too movement that maybe, yeah, sure, they did some things where they shouldn't have, but, um, you know, they're they're paying a hard price for it. But where's the fine line between, um, you know, is it okay to flirt even at the workplace or at school? Say you're at college and you're afraid to flirt because of everything that's going on. Could you walk us through some of the rules sure. for that? Yes. Well, first of all, let me say that we have to face something that, What we learned in the Me Too movement does not fit our actual reality. 60% of couples who marry met at work. (laughs) If you can believe that, that's untrue. And work is a good place to meet somebody because you get to watch how they handle situations from a distance. You get to see how they interact with people, how they communicate, how they handle problems that are given their way. And it's easy to see that from a distance and then say, wow, I really, really like that. 
male or female. Um, so companies themselves are, are in a, a difficult situation. And those who teach about sexual harassment will tell you, you know, we teach about not having, you know, intimate relationships with people at work, but it doesn't seem to stop. Well, of course, it's not going to stop. We can't just say, no, you cannot do that because people will not follow that. Nor should they, in my opinion. I agree with you. I think it's okay to be flirtatious. And I think it's written in our, I, I'm a big believer in genetics. I think that we can learn a lot about ourselves by understanding the way our hormones work. And let's face it, you have these hormones, some of which are uh, dopamine driven. They make you feel good. Flirting releases these hormones, as does a lot of other things. Attraction, just even looking at pictures or hearing kind words or hearing sexy words can turn them on. Now, we can't expect people, well, you just have to turn all that off. That's not natural. Um, so I think we have got to realize before you approach somebody in a, in a seeking out intimacy or sex, sex, because some sex is just sex, you know, you really need to make sure that they're on board for this mm -hmm. and listen to what they don't say. If somebody, if you say to somebody, wow, you look really great today, and then they're like, thank you, and keep going, that's a message. You know, it's like- It's a red flag, so those those types of- Yeah, sure, you've got to- Comments even. Right, being, uh, yeah, oh, I think, well, see, men look at these comments differently than women. Women may look at, the, at them as a good thing if it's a guy you're attracted to and, and you'd want to hear him, or a bad thing if it's a guy you're not. I think women have to learn, you need to send a signal right there. You want to hear more of this or not? And women are, you know, socialized to be nice. Mm -hmm. And as you say, to um, not, don't ruffle the feathers. So they will act like it was okay when really they do carry the feeling down the hallway or into their office and say, no, that wasn't, I didn't like it. Right, right. But men have to realize too that your words, do carry a signal. Men look at these as a test. You test a woman, see what her response is, and if she doesn't reject it, okay, maybe it's all right. So I think we've got to work together. I don't think we're going to solve these problems with me, women trying to overpower men. You know, there's this idea out there we're going to overthrow men and overthrow the patron. I don't see that as a solution to these problems. I see the solution is we have to start working together, yes, men yes. and women, to solve these problems. Women have to be comfortable in, in ignoring statements or even in saying, thanks, but you know, I'm not really interested in those kind of comments and feel that it's safe for them to not to be able to say that. And that's where workplaces, employers and corporations can come in, come in can come into play by making sure that women know that that's safe within their, you know, in their work environment. But men have got to be better at reading those signals. I agree. Men, men make way too many assumptions. Now I'm talking about everyday men because honestly, um, I've seen some pretty horrific sexual assaults, mm. both in my law enforcement and in my work as a psychologist. We're not talking about these guys. These guys are criminals. They're, They're committing predators. criminal acts. Yes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about them. We have, That's a different problem that the legal system has to solve. And these guys do need to be, you know, punished badly. I'm just talking about our everyday interaction. Yeah. People yes. are very uncomfortable with it right now. I'd love to be able to say, here, here's a step one, step two, step three. I don't think I'm in a position to do that, and I don't know anybody who really is, other than to say, we've got to rethink all of this and work together to be more open and honest with one another in the workplace, at home, you know, at the movies. You know, it's got to be okay for women to say what they think, what they feel, and, and it's got to be okay for men to be caring and sensitive enough to respect women. I agree. What about the extremes? So the other day I heard that in colleges, 
that even after um, a couple has intercourse and the woman approves of the sex and says, this is fine, and she signs a paper saying, you know, I agree to have sex with you, okay, because this is where we're at, as you know. I had heard that even after the couple has sex, she can withdraw. Yes. Now, can you explain some of that and just touch on why the extremes? Why are we going through these types of extreme things that we have to do today? Well, I think because we do have some extreme cases out there. And the idea behind that, that she can withdraw, is because there is an assumption that, well, we've had sex before, so, you know, of course, you have to do it again. And it's the idea that women, you know, you can do sex. We think that sex is always a good thing, but the truth is there's a lot of bad sex out there. Yes. And women are far more likely after sex to say to themselves, I didn't really like that. Oh, I don't okay. really like this person. Um, I don't really like what he did. And, you know, if we don't give that as a possibility to them to say, you know, I don't want to do that again. So this is a safety net for women? Perfect way to put it. Yes. It's a safety net. And it's the idea that, you know, you can do things once. It doesn't mean you have to do it again. And uh, yeah, it's a good thing, I think, for women. Now, are there extreme cases? Yes. We went through a period in American colleges, and we just ended the, that recently, where it did seem extreme to me at times. Uh, the, the idea was that the, uh, it, it was a policy that came out called the Dear Colleague Letter. It was just a policy that was given to colleges and universities across the And, of course, there are many interpretations of it, but my interpretation of it, and many others, was it was the idea that you have to lean more in the direct that the man, the male college student is guilty, that there's an assumption he's guilty. Now, that violates everything we think about criminal law. Absolutely. Um, But in colleges, that became policy for several years, that even if there was a preponderance of belief that it could have happened, he's guilty. And there were some pretty tragic cases around that. One was where a couple was in a dorm, I won't name the college in California, but uh, uh, the couple was having sex, and I think they called it roughhouse sex. Mm. And the the um, roommate, <laughs> called the campus police. And the girl herself, who was having sex with her boyfriend, said, yeah, we're having roughhouse sex, but that's just sex for us. It's not, he's not abusing me or anything. Mm-hmm. But the, excuse me just a second. You, can you hear my office is right by the train tracks? Um, no worries, I have that too. Okay. Uh, and in this particular case, and this is an extreme case, um, even though the girl herself said no, this was consensual sex between the two of us, he was still kicked out of school. Oh my gosh. So um, I have to say that, you know, some people began listening to the mothers of these boys. Right. Now, I know that there are staunch feminists who say, you know, the Secretary of Education should never have even met with these mothers of these boys. But the mothers of the boys have children too. They sure. love their sons. And they went and met with her and said, here's what's happened to my son because of these rules. He was guilty and he had no way to prove he was innocent. There was no hearing, no nothing. It's just he was automatically kicked out of school. Um, I think we've, we are rethinking that. Those policies have been pulled back for a oh, study God. and we're looking at how those work or don't work. The so bottom we're kind line of is- evolving through all this is what you're... You're saying well, like we're, we're seeing what works and, and what doesn't and what's fair and what's not. Yes, and I think we've got to get to the idea that we're not going to solve these ideas with politics. Relationships and intimacy, including emotional, psychological, and sexual intimacy, is very complicated. Mm-hmm. And it is true that in many, many cases where 
there's a belief there was sexual assault. The girls actually feel as though, well, I'm not really sure if I was sexually assaulted. I'm not sure if I gave consent. I'm not sure what he was thinking. And he may be thinking the same thing. Everything I'm telling you right now would be put to political incorrectness by many people. Right. But I have to tell the truth as I see it, which is, well, these com- these situations are complicated. They're not black. And, white. and um, we do have to, though, get to the idea where we realize the woman um, has a right to communicate her wishes and to, you know, she has control of her own body. She has to be able to communicate. The bigger problem, and I emphasize the bigger problem, is men have to respect Right. And I, I honestly don't think men do. We still have these frat parties going on that yes. are basically gang bangs. And uh, I've seen a couple of them on uh, YouTube and I'm they're terrifying. I'm like, oh, my God. And yes, some of these girls act like they're having fun. We have the problem of porn where girls are getting paid to act like they're enjoying this. Right. Porn. That's a like whole that. other problem right there. Yes, but, but, you know, the problem is, is that this is where our children as teenagers or even, uh, what do we call them, tweeners, tweeners. Kid, kids who are becoming adolescents, they're learning about sex on Pornhub or other porn sites. And so they're getting a lot of wrong ideas. I believe in freedom of expression, and I think we have to be careful when we start limiting what people can watch on. on uh, so there's no easy solution to say, well, we just you know need to get this off the internet. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the solution at all. But I think parents should know as much as possible about what their kids are watching, what their kids are yeah. seeing on the internet, and be willing to talk to them about it. One of the biggest problems when it comes to relationships and sexuality is still in 2019, so many parents abdicate their role to teach their children the realities of sex and sexuality and intimacy, how to treat someone you care about. And in my field, it's like we've got to crack that nut. We've got to figure out why parents are so reluctant to talk to their children. And why are children so reluctant to talk to their parents? We still have a generational divide when it comes to talking about it. It has improved. I, I mean, I see that it has improved on a regular basis because I ask my students, now, what, what did you learn about sex and healthy sex and bad sex from your parents? And <laughs> more and more, I'm getting positive responses, you know, that they did well, learn some good things. But I, we, we had a party at our house about three years ago, and a woman told this story. She's like, so I sat my daughter down when she was 15, and I told her, honey, any questions you have about sex, I want you to ask me because I will answer them for you. She said this. So my daughter looked at me, and she said, I do have a question, Mom. When, when I have an orgasm, is it supposed to hurt sometimes? This woman's jaw dropped. She's like, you've had orgasms. Yeah. With a boy. Yeah. This girl's already sexually active, and her mom doesn't even know it. Well, for one thing, she's 15 years old. (laughs) You should have had this talk about questions three or four years ago. Right. So overprotecting our children really puts them at risk. Yes. It's kind of like uh, something I tell my students about relationships in general that kind of blows them away. I'm like, you know, you all believe in love and they do. We all believe it. If you've experienced love, you know what it feels like. And it is real. But it, studies show that people who are overly romantic in their ideas about relationships are less likely to be happy in their relationships, mm. more likely to get a divorce, more likely to end up in a marriage where they feel abused or used or unhappy or Because these romantic notions that we have in our heads about Prince Charming, uh, about um, the man being the provider, the woman being his helpmate, 
these are kind of ancient ideas that do not work in the 21st century. So they're over, their expectations are too high uh, romantically. And, and I guess a lot of that comes from fairy tales. And that's why they're, they're on attack too. They don't want their children to read them because they're not based in reality. So I can totally see that. Right. Well, and, and I think they're ingrained in our culture. Right. That, you know, we still see that, you know, the man is the head of the house. We still see that the woman, you know, needs to be careful how she speaks to him. Um, she shouldn't tell him too much about her sexual needs because that may deflate his male ego. You know, um, women walk this tightrope all the time between, you know, we've got two ancient symbols in, in Christian culture, at least, uh, of you know, what it means to be a woman. One is the Virgin Mary. Right. <laughs> and when you study religious uh, re uh, religious doctrine, you find out that not only was the Virgin Mary a virgin, her mother was a virgin. You've got to say, wow, these people were really hung up on Virginia. women being virgins. Yeah. But the other symbol they have is Eve, the one who misled the man, who took his power, who... You know, made the pact with the devil and so on. It's like or Mary so, Magdalene too. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what we can say on your show, but oh, you it's know, fine. The slut, you yes. know. So women have got that two polar extremes. I've either got to be pure and virginal, or I've got to be a slut. Well, that's just not reality. You know, right. you were going to negotiate. Women are always going to be a far more practical, conscientious and thoughtful about relationships because they carry the uh, the outcomes of those relationships. Mm -hmm. She can get pregnant. She's more likely to get a sexually transmitted infection, comes through the semen. She's, well, I have to say quite honestly, men are more likely to want sex. Why? Because men almost always have an orgasm and an ejaculation in sex. For a woman, it's roll of the dice for her very often. And a lot of it depends on her partner. So she's, you know, his sexual technique, his skill, whether he, I call it a moral problem. I say to guys, you know, if you know how to get your wife or girlfriend off, but you don't want to take the time and effort it takes to do that, because it does take women, many women, sure. more, more time, a little more effort. And it's got to start earlier in the day. You want to start, you know, you want to have good lovemaking, you know. You do something nice in the morning. That's where it starts. Uh, so I constantly tell guys, you know, it's like, uh, um, you know, if that's what you want, um, you've got to, like, get this through your head. It's a moral question. Do you care about her enough to do that? That's moral. That's not about sex technique. Too often women get this. It's like, you know, I, I really like it better when you do it this way. It's like, too bad. You know, or that's what well, they take that as a personal attack, too. Yeah, exactly. Or or also of like, well, um, where'd you learn that? You know, we'll go. Right. As far as it's like, right. what have you been doing? Who have you been with? Right. So we've got to we have a long way to go to work these out. I do think the nice thing about being in my field right now is, I mean, I've taught in this field that for many years where you couldn't get the time of day out of people because everybody took relationships for granted. Mm. Those days came to an end in the last year or so. Right. right. And I'm taking, I'm happy to take advantage of that because I think that people in my field have a lot of answers to these. Problems. And now people are willing to listen. I mean, we've got everywhere you go, people will have relationships on their brain. Right. That's a right. good thing. So well, uh, the popularity of Dr. Jordan Peterson too. Um, you know, a lot of this circles back to, um, you know, what he's been talking about, too, with self-love and self-respect and bringing yeah. that to relationships. So um, for the folks out there that are struggling to find the right mate, maybe it's taking you, you know, years and you've been on every dating website and app and you're just finding the wrong people. The questions in your book, um, I think, I mean you tell me, are helpful to those types of folks as well. Um, could you just yes. explain how like a book like yours can help folks that are struggling 
to find a mate? Well, I think the biggest message from my book about personal responsibility, trust, and forgiveness, that that's what love is about, applies to yourself. <laughs> and yes. that's what I would say to any person is like, if you can't love yourself and understand, do things that are loving to yourself, how is anybody else going to love you? And how are you going to love them? Now, what do I mean by self-love? Well, okay, well, you could be a narcissist. We've mm. got that word right around now. And it's, a, it's we are aware of that. Some people are way too in love with themselves. You know, you can be egocentric, but loving yourself means this to me. It's knowing that you were born for a reason. <laughs> and I state that in my book. You know, knowing you were born for a reason, that you have a reason to be on this earth, mm -hmm. that you're not just a, a mistake or a freak of nature. That's where self-love begins. And that's a spiritual concept. Yes. Uh, and knowing that there's more meaning to just to my life than just, breathing the air through the day. And even then, I'm not even sure anybody cares whether I were here or not. You've got to know that you have some meaning and purpose to your life. And whatever that is, that you can pursue that and that you can be happy. To me, that's the second thing about loving yourself is doing the very things that make you happy. Now, what do we do? We do things that make other people happy. <laughs> We go to work, we make the boss happy, we make our coworkers happy. Oh, that's cool. And we delude ourselves that making other people happy, some well, we're gonna be happy because we made them happy. Mm -hmm. You gotta get rid of that idea because you know, you've got to do the things that make you happy. Now, for mothers, this is really a huge thing because you know, there's this stereotype of the mother that she's so dedicated to her children that her life belongs to her children okay uh you're not going to be too happy if your life belongs exclusively 100 percent to your children right. you've got to have take time all the things you would put into your children you've got to put into yourself first it's the best that is the biggest thing a mother can give her children also fathers too but we're talking about mothers you know, is the idea that I'm a person. I have beliefs. I have dreams. I have hopes too. I have a career that I'm pursuing. You know, I'm a person independent of anyone else. Now, I love myself. I buy myself things that are pleasant to me. I expect other people to treat me well and give me gifts. And, and I don't, hang out with people that just are sapping my energy for no right. reason. You know, when you do that, that's what your children see, both your boys and your girls. And then they emulate that. Right. So that self-love is self-care and caring about your own thoughts and feelings enough to know my thoughts are important. I can express them in a group. I don't have to bite my tongue all the time. And, you know, being a therapist, that's what you see a lot of is people who are really broken down to the point where they really feel that they're like uh don't belong anywhere you know that everything about them belongs to somebody else mm. and of course you got to get them doing the things is like okay that's nice that you're um taking your children over to you know, their sports but what are you going to do for yourself now guys are the same way they'll give over their lives to the devil to make a buck to their boss to their employer, right. and it's sadder to me than to see somebody who sold their life for some institution outside of themselves. And yeah, and that can cause a lot of relationship problems too, because yeah. they're looking for happiness somewhere, and right. they often go to wrong places to, right. to get it. You know, a psychiatrist explained this to me one time, and, and I latched onto it, and it works for me. You know, narcissists are people who don't really know who they are. They want something today. But they want something different tomorrow and they want something different than searching for something new. That's such a great point. And um, so, I mean, that starts early in life. And um, we just have to get to the point where we realize loving other people starts with loving myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what I would say to your people who are single. Love yourself first. Now, 
it's a lot easier to love yourself when somebody else loves you. Right. There's no better feeling. In fact, people ask me a similar question sometimes, which is, you know, from a scientific viewpoint, what's the best way to get over a broken heart? I'm like, find somebody else. Mm, <laughs> that's true. Someone else can change your life. I tell my students this. I'm like, I believe in love at first sight. I'm not saying you should jump into marriage with somebody you met, you know, yesterday. I think you should really take your time. But I do think we all have in our minds somebody, if we really work at it, we could put together on paper or just to hold in our hearts, so to speak, the kind of person that we would want to spend our lives with. What do they look like? How do they talk? What do they believe in? What do they uh, uh, pursue as challenges and goals in their life? How do they handle problems? Now, most of the time when we do that, what you're going to find is that person's a lot like you. <laughs> so you you're really saying want... make a vision board of yeah. the perfect person or the ideal partner for yourself, right. and you'll see a mirror image of who you, you are? Should, yes. If you don't see a mirror image, you have to question, oh, what do you think of yourself if you don't want somebody who's like you? I you know, love that exercise. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Well, I do encourage people to do that. But I do tell my students this. Of like, how are you going to know that if you don't know what you're looking for? Most people are sort of like shopping for a car. They don't really know what they want. You know, you should be able to get it down. And usually that person should share similar values to you. You know, here's why dating apps don't work most of the time. They work in the long run, but you go on a meet and greet or, you know, date. I, I love to be in the restaurants and you see these couples talking. And I always will nudge somebody and say, you know, <laughs> that's a meetup date. And you know why? Because they're listening to each other. They're actually right, right, right. talking to each other. You would see the married nice. couples, their faces are buried in screens or whatever, you know. Anyways, so um, where, where I was going with this is, how are you going to know when you meet this person if you haven't, if you don't know what they feel like? Now, you can't know on a dating app what a person smells like. We know from research. <laughs> no, honestly, smell is a huge factor in whether you really want to be with a person. It doesn't mean they, that this person smells bad or has body. It's pheromones, issues. right? Exactly. It's pheromones. It's their pheromones matching your pheromones. And it's a very magical moment to be with a person like that. Also, you know, it's also quite visual for both men and women. I mean, we're all attracted to attract people. The thing with women is women can ne negotiate that a little bit. You know, he may not be look perfect, but they'll fall in love with the way he looks. Unfortunately, guys are, we are wired to be very visually oriented. We stick with the looks just a little too long. Yeah. You know? And it's like, you've got to look at the whole person. And, you know, a smart man will do that. Um, and you've got to have enough experience to know you, I mean, I think that what dating apps give us is a lot of bad experiences. Yeah. They tell us what we don't want. Mm -hmm. And then when we find what we do want. So I do tell my students, I got to get to this point. You never know. You could walk out of this room, walk up the stairs, walk into the hallway, and suddenly there's somebody there that's going to rock your world. Mm -hmm. It's a magical moment. And I think for people who are dealing with heartbreak, or who are single still looking for that person that they can be with and they want to be with, A, love yourself, work on yourself, know what you're looking for, and be ready when it comes along. Because it will come along. I believe that there is someone for everyone. For everyone, yeah. Well, we have seen people, boy, the odds are against them. You know, they have chronic conditions. They have um, psychological or mental issues or neurological problems, or they have have uh, been in accidents or things like that it, it, it's difficult but now this is one of the pluses of dating apps of like if you know what you're looking for there are apps that you can go to find that you know if you have a certain condition you can use google or 
certain dating apps want somebody of a specific religion or background, you can pinpoint that with some of the dating apps. And so I say, but you're never really going to know until you meet that person. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is in the chemistry. I'm a big believer in chemistry as well. That you could meet somebody who's looks on paper so perfect for you, but when you meet them, just not. Right, not the right person. Yeah. So in, in closing, um, what other advice do you have for folks that are in um, maybe a bad relationship and they they just can't get out of it? Because I meet a lot of women that yes. are in bad relationships that just suffer through them. So like, what advice do you have for those folks? Um, here's what we, happens when we get into a relationship. Now, I'm not speaking about every single person, but I think everybody will relate to this. We let ourselves go. <laughs> it's a strange, strange phenomenon that I watch and I think, why would a person let themselves go? Like, put on the 40 pounds, the men get the big beer belly, uh, uh, you know, you don't. You don't brush your teeth properly. You don't get to the dentist or, you know, if you're a woman you, or a man, you know, you don't take care of your appearance in any way. Uh, you get lazy. You watch a lot of shows and TV. You're preoccupied with sports, which I'm not going to, well, I'm probably stepping on some toes now, but I, I always wonder when I hear somebody say, oh, we really whipped them. I'm like, no, you sat on your sofa and watched it on TV, right. they them, you know. You're living your life vicariously. But we let ourselves go. And I, I do think that women have higher expectations in relationships than more for a relationship. And they're willing to give up more for a relationship. But the problem is they expect more back. A lot of our problems in our relationships are our expectations. Right. We have unrealistic expectations. That's a problem. It's like nobody could live up to what you're hoping for. There's no Prince Charming there. There's, you know, I, I like to say this, Sex in the City was not a documentary, people. Too many women I see are like, they've watched too much of that show, and they're like, oh, wow, that would be my life. If I could just get rid of this SOB that I'm married to, I'd be living in a high-rise in Manhattan with high heels and, uh, you know, somebody, some all these attractive guys would be giving me whatever I want, and I'd be playing them. You know, it's not a documentary. Right. right. Hang on, our <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so I would say look at your expectations and be willing to work on yourself. Part of working on yourself in a relationship is being more forceful about what you want and what you expect. And if you're just, if you've done that and you're not getting it and you're not going to get it, if you're not, We'll speak about women. If you're with somebody who's just not interested in being the person that you need, I do think you have to think about, well, life is short. Yeah. I need to go out. We're seeing an increase, though. I, I, I don't know what I think about this. I can only point it out. Of late life divorces, people in their 60s and sometimes their 70s divorcing. And the idea is this is like, well, I've only got a short time left. Ah. Uh. I'm going to go find that happiness that has eluded me. I don't know if that's a good idea. It seems related to me to people who retire and, and think, I'm going to move off to some remote island and live this bohemian life. I'm, yeah. I'm well, like, are they looking for other partners, though? Like, have you run into that where these divorced older folks are looking to hook up with other people? I mean, is it that, yes, too? Or? I think they are. And I think they are under... Uh, and, and I. I mean, there are more uh, older people who are single and who are looking for a relationship. Mm. And we do gravitate towards people who are like ourselves as far as our previous relationship. For example, we know that somebody who's lost a spouse to death, a widower or a widower, they're going to be more attracted to somebody else who lost right. to death. People who have been married and divorced are going to be attracted to people like that. I just think... The best, I would say this, do everything you can to work on the relationship, which really does mean work on yourself. You can't tell another person to love you. You can't teach another person to have feelings they don't have. 
but you can ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't hurt to forcefully ask. But often, you know, we demand things in an angry way. Well, demanding things in an angry way from somebody like, you've got to start doing this for me or doing that. For never me. works. It never works. So you've got to take personal control of your life. Know what you want. At, which is also a problem for many of these people who are in bad relationships. You, you, you don't like what you got because you don't even know what you want. Right. And have a realistic plan for what you want. And then, you know, the third step would be decide, is this person ever going to be able to do this? Mm -hmm. And then, if you love yourself, you don't just immediately exit the relationship. And I'll tell you why, because this might be the best option for you in the present time and stick with it and do some other things with your life that you're going to find meaning. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying run off and, you know, have an affair or be unfaithful or anything like that. But I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of ways to find meaning in your life outside of relationships, you know, taking on a new cause, taking on uh, uh, some venture to help other people. Yeah. I mean, that's where meaning comes from. And that's what everybody's looking for in relationships and out is you want meaning, but you got to find that for yourself. Maybe it comes through your faith. Maybe it comes through something else. I hope it doesn't come through your work because I think placing the meaning of your life in your job, your career role, your profession is always a mistake. And that's a thing that a lot of people that dedicate their lives to work, you know, will get fired one day and then have that realization and their lives just come crumbling down. So self-love is really like the crux of your book from beginning to end. Yes. Well, self-love means learning to forgive yourself because we've all made mistakes. And forgiveness means picking up, dusting yourself off. And you you have that power in your hands every day to change your life. Every right. day you wake up. You got to, this is, could be the day that you do something different you didn't do yesterday or the day before or for the last 30 years. You know, so loving yourself means forgiving yourself for the past, moving on into the future, whatever that future is, and being exploratory about it. And it also means, you know, taking care of yourself, knowing what you believe knowing what you love to do, spending money on yourself, mm. doing things that make you happy. Um, and then when you're doing that for yourself, then you start looking at this other person and say, how does that person fit me who I am now? Uh, because it's contagious. Loving yourself is contagious. I can tell you, you know, Sometimes people are afraid to love themselves in relationships. And like, if I start doing what I really love and saying what I really think and feel, it's going to be the end of this relationship. Right, right. It be true, but I'd say in more cases, that's going to be contagious. It's going to cause some uproar a little bit if you haven't been doing it in the past, but I would recommend it. Like, if you're unhappy, I, I, the worst thing you can do and you're caught in a swamp is just sit there because you're right. thinking, you know. It's always time to do something different. And I encourage people to do that. Live life to the fullest. That sounds great. A great way to close. Thank okay. you so much, Dr. Jory. I could talk to you for hours. This is such a fascinating subject. And I know a lot of people will benefit from this conversation. And I thank you so much. Carolyn, thank you for reading Cupid on Trial, what we learn about love and loving good stuff. Thanks for having me on the show. I really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm so glad you did.